Hello, and welcome to another one of my Apes videos. This time we'll be looking at Chapter 10, Land, Public, and Private. We'll start off by talking about the tragedy of the commons. That is, a tendency of a shared, limited resource to become depleted because people act from self-interest for short-term gain. I'm sure that you've done some sort of lab in class, if you're not in my class, uh, but in our class we did a lab with goldfish where we didn't know the tragedy of the commons at first, and everyone took all of the goldfish out of the dish. They weren't able to repopulate, and everyone ended up starving uh, as their next season of fishing came and went. Uh, so it is the self-interest that gets people to, when there's this public resource, want to just take more and more because no one owns it. And that's a big problem, right? Private ownership or regulation could solve it because if somebody owned it, they could yell, hey, stop taking all the fish. But if everyone owns it, then it gets neglected. Nobody stands up for it. So water, air, and land could all be considered commons, and that also goes for anything else that's shared. So we were looking at fish. That certainly is something that's internationally shared and a big debate. Another thing that's going to come into play with this unit is externalities. That is, the cost or benefit of a good or service that is not included in the purchase price of that good or service. There's two examples that go along with this in your textbook, and it has to do with a bakery. If you live next door to a baker, you're going to get the scent of all the baked goods, and that's free, right? That's not in the cost of that good or service. You just happen to get this externality, this nice smell that wafts through your home. But if they go to work early, let's say they're up at 3 a.m. getting things ready for the day, they're going to be making noise. That also is an externality. So they can be good or they could be bad depending on what it is. So for example, here we have an externality of all of this air pollution that is coming from this factory and going over to, well, the surrounding area. So an externality of whatever they're producing would be that the air quality around that place is lower than what it should be. Here's a cartoon that shows how negative externalities could work with environmental science. It says, Maybe now they'll notice environmental externalities. And you see that worker that's sitting on top of the power stations. Most likely the glaciers have melted from global warming from all of the power station air pollutants. So that's just one way that this could work. Another one of the big ideas for use of land has to do with maximum sustainable yield. We want to get the most out of our limited land supplies that we can. Not every area is good for everything. So, it's the maximum amount that can be harvested without compromising the future availability of that resource. We want to get the maximum that we can without depleting what we have. So, how do we do that? Well, in theory, what you would do is you would grow things to their maximum rate when they are at about half capacity. Think back to when we were talking about population growth curves. You've got your J fast growth, which is exponential, and as things start to get closer and closer to carrying capacity, things turn into that S-shaped curve and they start to grow less quickly. So you want to hit the peak growth. You want to have things growing as fast as they can, and that's at about half. And this is also, in theory, different things react differently to the amount of resources, so it depends on what you're looking at. But the idea is to keep things at that very, very high rate, so especially with food, which we'll look at in the next chapter, we can turn out as much as we can without making things difficult for the area. So in terms of land, we've got public and we have private. And here you can see an international map of public lands. And you can also see that it says 11% or one ninth of the Earth's land is protected in one way or another. We'll delve deeper into the different ways they're protected, but they can either be protected for habitat, they can be protected for resources. It depends on the area and why we value it so much. You can also notice that there are some of those spots in the water. There are in fact places, not just land, that we do also have these protected areas because they're important. They have specific things that we want to uphold and so we keep them protected. Oh, of the international public lands, we have six different categories. Each of them has their own little subtle way that they're different from the other ones, but they all have a general theme of preservation. National parks are preserved for a variety of reasons. They are recreational places. They are places where scientific studies can be done. Sometimes they are there to help native species, uh, give them some habitat that is protected. And also, we preserve them for their natural beauty. One thing the national parks don't usually encourage is the extraction of natural resources. On occasion, there are some places that allow it, but getting timber, mining, these are things that don't often happen in national parks. 
On the other hand, there are the managed resource protected areas. These places do have sustained use of biological, mineral, and recreational resources. So similar to the national parks, but they do allow for some of these ecosystems to be used for their resources. Of course, the main goal of these protected areas is to protect natural ecosystems and use natural resources sustainably when conservation and sustainable use can be mutually beneficial. They are managed for multiple uses in most places, and there are many sites, 4,100 or more, that exist worldwide. Habitat and species management areas are also a little bit different than those. They are mostly there to, well, maintain biological communities. But this does mean that they are managed so that there can be hunting and conservation on these sites. And these are also a bit more common with 27,000 plus sites that do exist globally. Strict nature reserves and wilderness areas are much more careful in how they protect their organisms. They do not allow hunting. They are there to fully protect uh, the things that live there and the environments that they live in. For the protected landscapes and seascapes, they do allow the extraction of natural resources, but it must be non-destructive. There is also tourism and recreation in these areas, given they can be quite beautiful, and there are 6,000 plus sites that exist globally. Lastly, of the international public lands, we have national monuments. These are sites that protect unique sites and landmarks. They can be of natural or cultural interest, or, you know, they could be something historical, like, for instance, uh, these arches that you see in the picture, and 20,000 plus sites exist. In terms of the public lands in the United States, there are a few agencies that help manage the different lands. So there is the Bureau of Land Management, or BLM, the United States Forest Service, or USFS, the National Park Service, NPS, and the Fish and Wildlife Services. Well, what are these different places concerned with? BLM lands have grazing, mining, timber harvesting, and recreation that are associated with them. The USFS lands have timber harvesting, grazing, and recreation. NPS has recreation and conservation. And the FWS lands have wildlife conservation, hunting, and recreation. So there is some overlap, but they each kind of have their own little niche. In addition to the lands that we are using for resources, we also have to be concerned about residential land. Our residential land use has been expanding due to our increasing population. Two words we should be familiar with are suburban, surrounding metropolitan centers and have low population densities compared with those urban areas. We also have exurban, similar to suburban, but are unconnected to any central city or densely populated area. In addition to the growth of the suburban and exurban areas, we also have to be considerate of urban sprawl the creation of urbanized areas that spread into rural areas and remove clear boundaries between the two. It tends to occur at the edge of a city replacing farmland. So these are city centers that are growing and growing and growing and the suburban area and the surrounding area continues to grow outward until you have this entirely urbanized area where once there was this more rural area. So what causes this urban sprawl? Well, there are four main causes. Automobiles and highway construction make it easier to travel away from the city. So folks aren't going to be living there if they have a way to get in and out easily. Two, the living costs. It's a very high cost to live in the city. I'm sure if you've talked to anyone trying to live in New York City, it is extremely expensive. Very, very different compared to the cost of living in the suburbs. The third thing that leads to urban sprawl is urban blight. The degradation of the built, the actual environment, and the social environment of the city that often accompanies and accelerates migration to the suburbs. So we're going to look at an image of how this works, but the degradation of the place, because nobody is living there, leads to the city center becoming dirty, becoming uh, an area that is not exactly the safest, so it can definitely lead to people wanting to not live in that area. The fourth reason is government policies. So the government policy that we're talking about here specifically is the Highway Trust Fund, which was begun by the Highway Revenue Act of 1956, and it paid for the building and maintenance of large highways, roads that went right into the city. So this is a way to encourage people to not live in the city. Again, if it's easy to get there, you're going to have people that don't want to live there. It, it, it's going to be much easier to drive your car, go to the suburbs, have a little bit of a bigger piece of land. So they're going to most likely 
travel to the city, work there, and then come home. There's also induced demand, which we'll talk about in a moment with another image, but that is an increase in the supply of a good, which causes demand to grow. And then lastly, zoning separates business and residential areas. Zoning can definitely come into play with how urban areas can have sprawl as well. As well. So in this diagram, we see that this is a, a way that urban blight can operate. If the population starts to shift to the suburbs for a variety of reasons, your city budget is going to decrease. Your tax revenues decline, which then means you are going to have less services. Less money means that you can do less for that area. And since services are going to be cut, you're going to have fewer customers, businesses are going to leave, and then because all of these people are leaving, businesses leave, you're going to have the neighborhood declining. They're going to have just less money, less taxes, less services, all these things perpetuate, and then people are going to leave again, right? So population shifts, there's going to be even less uh, that you're going to get from tax revenue, and so it continues and continues and continues. And this is the cycle of urban here we can see a cycle of induced demand. It starts at the green arrow with increased gasoline tax revenues. And because they get all these extra taxes, they're going to create more highways. Well, because there's more highways, the suburbs are going to expand, right? If more people can drive in, more people can be around these big roads, and so you get more suburbs. But that leads to more traffic, that leads to a longer commute, and that also leads to more gas. And since it's a gasoline tax, well, that increases as well. So more gas tax leads to more construction, more suburbs, more traffic, longer commute, more gas, and so on and so forth until you have an enormous urban area with, again, more of these highways and more of this induced demand. So going back to zoning, zoning was a practice that was used to figure out in an area or in a city which places can go where, uh, what places can be used for industry, where are people going to live, and so you would have these separations of these zones and it could severely limit how much people could get from one place to another without a dependency on vehicles. Luckily, uh, a lot of the cities now are using multi-use zoning, and you can see from this, all these different colors of these different zonings, you can get a whole bunch of residents, stores, shops, uh, entertainment places. You get a lot of different zones all clustered together, and that can lead to less gas or less mass transit use in the long run.